Hi, this is the news, and welcome to it. Wow, look at all this news! Stonks, Dogecoin, and a pandemic, which is still... Oh, let me check. Yep, still happening. You know that whole trope where humanity finally decides on world peace when faced with an alien invasion? Like, it would take some kind of malevolent force that targets all of humanity for us all to come together and defend our existence. Well, in reality, if malevolent aliens came to invade Earth, we would spend most of our time debating their existence while Ted Cruz retweets an I identify as the aliens headline from the Babylon Bee and the rest of our time watching various CEOs offer automated delivery services of human brains to the aliens using DoorDash drivers who also get eaten by the aliens. This pandemic reveals how the champions of capitalism are willing to risk human extinction to make about a dozen people extremely wealthy. Capitalist cheerleaders like to say that the market will be able to sort out what's best for humanity through the magic of competition. And any little gaps left over will be filled in by charity and philanthropy. So let's check in on one of the world's biggest philanthropists, Bill Gates. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has been such a force for good in the world, evidence that rich people really do want to solve all of the world's problems. For example, they're donating money to help increase access to COVID vaccines in low-income countries, and in April 2020, Oxford University pledged to donate the rights to its COVID vaccine to any drug maker, making it open source. This would make the vaccine recipe available to all drug makers all over the world, vital in creating enough doses to inoculate the global population at low costs and in poorer countries as well. So, yeah, we did it. Capitalism works and worked. The rich did it. Cody's showdy Ovi over. Let's pack it in. We're packing it in. We're going to pack, pack it in. There, there's another page here. So I'm just going to, I don't think it'll affect anything, but it's going to give it a quick, quick little read over COVID. It's okay. So the good news is there's more showdy. And the bad news is, there's bad news. Just two weeks after Oxford pledged to donate the rights of its COVID vaccine, making it open source, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation convinced them to instead sign an exclusive deal with AstraZeneca, one of the pharmaceutical companies, the BM, Foundation has invested in. This grants AstraZeneca sole rights to Oxford's COVID vaccine with no promise of making the vaccine affordable. Basically, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation held millions of potential grants and funding over Oxford's head in exchange for the deal, which benefits AstraZeneca and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation's investments and like, not other people. But, but why? Would the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation promise to donate millions of dollars to make COVID vaccines more accessible, just to turn around and cut a deal with Oxford and AstraZeneca that could stand to make them billions at the expense of others? We may never know what could make someone do such a thing, but as K.M. Gopakumar, the legal advisor to the Third World Network says, if we change the way in which you regulate the industry or the ways in which you want medicines or vaccines to be produced and delivered, it's definitely going to affect these companies' business model and also the investments of Gates Foundation. So they are using their money to reinforce the status quo. Weirdly, Interestingly, coincidentally, Bill Gates' wealth has increased during the pandemic by over $10 billion. Gosh, it, it, it's almost like this whole charitable foundation of his is mostly about making him money with any actual charity being a bit of a fun little byproduct. It is weird. So... How's that plan of using charity to make Bill Gates and friends super wealthy and leaving a few crumbs behind for the poor? Well, it's looking kinda grim right now. The global vaccine rollout, especially to poorer countries, is an absolute bumble show of a butt. Studies project that at current rates, poorer countries won't see their populations vaccinated for years. 
In no small part due to companies like AstraZeneca, you know, who got sole rights to that Oxford vaccine. They were going to make open source until Bill Gates said, please, please don't do that, please. But uh uh-oh, and golly gosh, they're now underproducing the vaccine. I'm being told uh, because relying on a private company who is motivated by profits to save people who may not have a lot of money is actually not a super great and smart idea. Maybe it should have been open source. And it's not as if the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation champions of thinking just don't realize what they're doing is a global health oopsie goofer. In October 2020, diplomats from South Africa and India came to the World Trade Organization to plead with pharmaceutical companies to waive their patents during the duration of the pandemic so that all countries could afford the vaccine. This concern is made even more clear when you find out that countries like South Africa are paying twice the amount that the EU is paying for the AstraZeneca vaccine. Why? Because the EU invested in the development of the vaccine, even though it was tested on South African study participants in Johannesburg. Weird. It's like white Western colonialism that uses black bodies for their own profit never went away. Hmm. As if the global economic institutions that profited from slavery in the past are still finding ways to exploit people. And this is just a really obvious example of it highlighted by a crisis. Huh. So much for making racism illegal, Abraham Lincoln. Nice try, mister. But despite the South African and Indian diplomats' humanitarian proposal, AstraZeneca refused, putting their profits over people. You see this? This is my shocked face. This is my pants-pissing look of total f***ing surprise. So... Pharmaceutical companies like AstraZeneca are hoarding patents and forcing poor countries to pay double for the vaccine, which means we're probably looking at years before we see everyone getting access to the vaccine globally. And that's uh, bad because millions of people are going to uh, get sick and uh, die just because they were born in a not super rich country. I'll bet that's a good enough reason to care for everyone listening to me right now because you're a bunch of cuties with working empathy goo. But hey, let's say you're a ghoul, all right? Why should you, a ghoul, care? Well, as it turns out, allowing a virus to rampage through billions of people, even if you can't see them from your high-rise yacht, is bad because we're all human. No, this isn't a speech about empathy. (laughs) I know, I know you don't have any of that. This is from a biological perspective. The longer a virus has to spread through a population, the more chances it gets to mutate. And the more likely one of those mutations will turn out to make the virus deadlier or more resistant to vaccines. Let me see if I can I can I can put this into terms that the richies can understand. It's like it's like it's like it's like it's like if you gamble on the stock market. The more stocks, aka human bodies, you, the virus, gets to own, the more likely you're going to become stronger and some of your gambling is going to pay off. This isn't just a fun biological thought exercise. It's literally happening right now. You may have heard of the COVID variants from the UK that are spreading more easily, but there's also a COVID variant found in South Africa and now in the US that may be both more transmissible and less responsive to vaccines. South Africa, that that sounds familiar. Oh, we talked about it 10 seconds ago about the South African diplomat who asked pharmaceutical companies to make the vaccine accessible to their country to help them inoculate people, which would probably maybe have stopped this new strain from developing. Don't worry though, I'm sure if this strain starts to wreak havoc on the rest of the world, we'll find a way to blame South Africa in a super racist and xenophobic way. Yay? Sorry, I I have this thing where when I reach a certain level of despair, I say, yay, don't worry. It's just the sound of my brain getting fried by sadness and rage. Yay! So if we allow the virus to spread and destroy lives in poorer countries, it's going to come back to bite us in the ass, not just morally or karmically, but biologically as the chances of creating a deadlier, stronger, and more resistant virus becomes way more likely. Which, let me check with my science expert. Dr. Katie Stoll, a doctor from a medical perspective, 
Is people dying bad? Well, Cody, if you look at this science chart, here is an alive person, figure A, and here is a dead person, figure B. Now, if you examine the data using a mathematical model to take the square root of the formula of being alive, you will conclude that being dead is in fact bad. BBC QED. Well, there you have it, folks. Which is weird because it's almost like the rich ruling class would prefer a bunch of people to die over helping them. Almost like they're more afraid of losing some of their total power than they are of human extinction. That may seem like an exaggeration, but let's look at some research. Oh, Cody, do you, do you need another chart? No, it's- Remember, Q-E-D. Yes, right. Qued. So, studies back in May of 2020 found that over 36,000 lives in the US could have been saved if lockdown measures had started even just a week earlier. Another analysis shows that if the US had done a serious lockdown early on, like South Korea, Australia, Germany, and Singapore, between 70 and 99% of Americans who died from COVID may have been saved. It's easy enough to draw the conclusion that the lack of lockdowns in the US was a mere calculation of the economy over human lives, but even that doesn't quite make sense. An analysis by the World Bank found that earlier lockdowns not only saved lives, but had less negative impacts on the economy. Countries like South Korea that contained the virus by successfully locking down and paying people to stay home seemed to get less wrecked, economically speaking. South Korea's GDP shrank by only 1.1% compared to the US's 9%. So countries who locked down early and got people to stay home are doing better both in the whole keeping people alive thing and economically. This just in, uh, the ear thing, killing a bunch of people and having the constant threat of a deadly unabated virus may actually not be so great for the economy. So in the US, Either we have a bunch of foolish billionaires, a distinct possibility, or there's something that billionaires fear more than a pandemic. After all, so far the pandemic hasn't hurt them too bad. In fact, many billionaires are doing quite well. Jeff Bezos has added a cool $35 billion to his wealth. Mark Zuckerberg with a measly $25 billion. And like I said earlier, Bill Gates, philanthropist, got $10 billion. So the pandemic's not really hurting the wealthiest in their pockets, but you'd think the prospect of breeding an unstoppable super virus by letting it munch away at the pores would be scary. But there's something even scarier, the pores. Specifically, the poors realizing they can and should demand more from their governments. After all, if the government can pay people a living wage to stay home, what's next? Paying people health care, free education, food security? Where does it end? Asks ghouls like GOP Senator Lindsey Graham, who took a stand against $600 unemployment checks back in April 2020. Quote, I promise you, over our dead bodies will this get reauthorized, he said. Dead bodies, huh? Cool choice of words during a deadly pandemic. Real, obvious, dramatic irony. Very, very Sorkin-esque, Lindsay. But then he gives the game away. Graham said, quote, it was never our goal to pay people more to be out of work than at work. If a person is making $23 an hour on unemployment, it's going to be hard to get you to go back to work for $17 an hour job. That right there, that's what they're afraid of. People suddenly feeling what it's like to be valued. Suddenly being given a scrap of dignity and realizing that maybe they should demand that little piece of dignity when companies beg them to come back to work. If you want to know what scares a rich ghoul, it's this, right here. A poster on the unemployment subreddit titled, For Four Months I Felt Normal. This person wrote, for the four months that the $600 was in place, I got to feel normal for the first time in my entire life. 
For once, I could afford all my bills and have a little left over to enjoy. My entire adult life, I worked jobs that paid just over the minimum wage. I worked hard and never got ahead financially. I even felt the government was doing right by me for the first time. I don't know if we'll ever see that again, but it was nice while it lasted. It's sad that the majority is left out and that it took a once in a lifetime pandemic to be able to feel what it is like to make a fair amount of money. I still maintain that the problem wasn't the $600, it was the fact that so many jobs pay so poorly. That? That scares the shit out of the Lindsey Grahams and Bill Gateses of the world. That is what they fear far more than a pandemic growing out of control. Someone getting just a tiny glimmer of comfort and normalcy and wondering why they don't deserve this the rest of the time. Why can't they keep that little $600 which makes such a huge difference to them while Jeff Bezos makes $35 billion extra during a pandemic? That's probably part of the reason the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation was so threatened by Oxford making their COVID vaccine open source. Because if they did that, people might start to wonder why other vaccines shouldn't be open source. If it saves so many lives at so low a cost, why don't we do it with other vaccines? Why do we beg and plead for scraps from generous billionaires like Bill Gates when we could make global health care a reality ourselves? It might mean we question why COVID vaccines developed using public funds and government funded research are being sold by private companies globally at a profit. So the pharmaceutical companies get government subsidies and the rest of the world gets rugged free market capitalism. It's interesting. It's as, it's as if socialism is good and maybe there's a reason private companies are hoarding it for themselves. The thing is, people realizing their worth, their collective power, and the positive impacts of sharing wealth is scarier than a super mutant COVID virus to them. And that's... I'm not sure how to put it into words. Haha, <laughs> I knew you'd need more charts. You were so right. As you can see, illustrated by this diagram. That's a penis. Yes, a science penis. Very educational. Thank you, Katie. Maybe, maybe it's break time. So, here's some news. A commercial. Are you in the free market for sound? Sound in your ears? My ears? Well, these are mine. They're comfortable, charge really fast, have a long battery life, and again, are mine. I use them to get away from screens while still consuming. Always be, must be consuming. You can't have mine, but we teamed up with Raycon and they're offering everyone watching this video 15% off your order. Just click on the link in the description box. Raycon was founded by Ray J and their earbuds are beloved by Snoop Dogg and other. It probably says something that celebrities still go for a more affordable earbud because Raycon makes premium wireless audio for half the price. So range of colors and patterns, various fit options, and no dangling wires or stems. You know, those annoying little stemmy danglers. They have a 45 day free return policy, which is 180 cycles of playtime, which is six hours. So if you get two pairs and keep swapping them out every six hours, by your 180th swap out, you can return one of the pairs still. If you're trying to take a break from screens but don't want to feel totally unplugged, Raycon Wireless Earbuds. That's the name. Instead of looking at your favorite angry news show host's hideous face, simply listen to his hideous voice. I'm doing it right now. I wear them all the time, listening to music and podcasts, often forgetting I have them in until they die after six hours. Click the link in the description box or go to buyraycon.com slash some news to get 15% off your Raycon purchase. Here they are. Diddle it a lot. Diddle it a lot. Hi, welcome back. Oh, hello. Ah. So, the super wealthy monsters who get to hoard vaccines and money would rather see the ship go down than risk giving people a taste of economic freedom. And this death culty response to the pandemic happens to highlight other cracks in our society. 
While we may see the capitalistic death cult more clearly during a pandemic, it's always been there. And we can see evidence of that in some of the communities where the pandemic has hit the hardest. Earlier, we talked about how AstraZeneca used South African bodies to test the vaccine and then denied them access to the patent and charged them double for the vaccine. It's a pretty perfect demonstration of how Western colonialism still exploits other countries with callous regard to their lives. But hey, I don't even have to leave the comfort of my own country to see this happening. Yes, even though Abraham Lincoln made racism illegal in 1862, and then LBJ made racism double illegal in 1964, weirdly, racism seems to still exist. And not just the on-the-nose, proud boys marching around with their loser Confederate flag, cosplaying in their desert camo in urban environments way. See, the pandemic is hitting black and brown communities hardest, which seems weird because the coronavirus itself can't be racist. Unless, huh, an improvement, honestly. Anyway, research into the impact of COVID has shown that black communities die from the virus at two to three times the rate as one would expect based on their share of the population. Latinx communities also see a disproportionate number of COVID cases compared to their population up to four times than they should experience. Native communities in the US, including in Alaska, are seeing COVID cases at 3.5 times that of non-Hispanic whites. White communities, meanwhile, see fewer deaths than one would expect given our share of the population. And I know this is getting some Nazis hard as a rock right now, reaching for their calipers to tweeze their dicks and claim that for some reason, coronavirus just happens to spare white people more because our buttholes are the perfect Aryan shape or whatever. But to actual scientists, this is a very wrong explanation. As epidemiologist and director of public policy at AMFAR, Greg Millett says, there's a structural issue that's taking place here. It's not a genetic issue for all non-white individuals in the US. So put away your butthole calipers, Nazis. The, the epidemiologist didn't say that last part, that was me, the, the butthole caliper thing, just to clarify. So it's not a coincidence that the communities that have endured some of the most long-term oppression, genocide, and exploitation in the US are being hit hardest by the pandemic. Another person who knows stuff, Dr. Marcela Nunez-Smith, director of the Equity Research and Innovation Center at Yale School of Medicine says, we know that these racial ethnic disparities in COVID-19 are the result of pre-pandemic realities. It's a legacy of structural discrimination that has limited access to health and wealth for people of color. The structural lack of access to healthcare in black and brown communities means that people with preventable disease like diabetes, heart, and lung disease struggle to get treatment. And having these diseases makes COVID infections more dangerous and deadly. Also, people of color are more likely to have frontline and essential jobs, you know, the jobs we applaud and cheer for until it actually comes to raising their wages or improving their working conditions. This is something to consider when people talk about the impact of racism in this country. It's not just Confederate flag-waving weirdos or when PragerU defends slavery, although those things are both extremely bad. It's also found in the systemic structural inequalities in our institutions like healthcare, which has always existed, but is especially noticeable when a pandemic reveals horrifying statistics, like how black counties that make up 30% of the US population are the location of 56% of COVID deaths. It's interesting too, and when I say interesting, you know I'm about to say something horrible, but it's interesting how getting the country back to work and businesses are suffering always seems to be framed as a middle America white dude issue. Anti-lockdown protests seem to draw in the white supremacist crowds who capitalize on the lockdowns as a way to say that white people are being oppressed by using fun slogans like Arbeit macht frei, JB, which is German for work sets you free. It's a slogan that was featured at the entrance of the Auschwitz Nazi death camp. JB refers to the Jewish governor of Illinois, JB Pritzker. Now I'm no branding expert, but I think rooting your anti-lockdown argument in the slogan of a literal death camp where people were worked to death and died of disease in large numbers is maybe a swing and a miss. But the big thinkers over at Proud Boy University may need to check their math, because according to data from this past December, the people most likely to lose their jobs due to the pandemic are women of color. 
That's not to say that there aren't many white people who have lost their jobs or are suffering economically due to the pandemic. But it does kind of poke a hole in the old white supremacist, brown people are t they're taking our jobs and they're stealing our freedoms theory. Of course, racism isn't the only piss stain that the pandemic is shining a light on. Legal advocates and civil rights groups have reported that hospitals have been denying life-saving care to people with physical and mental disabilities. In March 2020, a woman with a mental disability was given a DNR, do not resuscitate order, without her consent by hospital staff in Oregon. Staff of that same hospital also requested that the woman's group home fill out DNR forms for the rest of their mentally disabled residents prior to them coming to the hospital. Despite Despite this, the hospital was not sanctioned by the Oregon Health Authority. There are apparently shockingly few safeguards in place to protect the medical rights of people with cognitive disabilities. In another alarming, sort of eugenics-ish move, pandemic disaster preparedness plans for certain states openly threaten to withhold treatment for people with mental disabilities. A ProPublica report found that Alabama's pandemic plan detailed that, quote, persons with severe mental retardation, advanced dementia, or severe traumatic brain injury may be poor candidates for ventilator support. Other states are less openly discriminating, but have no protections in place if a doctor decides that in triage, people with cognitive disabilities should be given less priority. This is especially concerning given that the American Bar Association's Commission on Disability Rights has found a negative bias against people with disabilities amongst healthcare providers. The report states, quote, studies have consistently demonstrated that healthcare providers hold negative views of people with disabilities and fail to fully appreciate the value and quality of life with a disability. I believe the Nazis referred to such people as useless eaters. But anyway, this is not me, Cody, saying, I hate doctors, I hate nurses and healthcare workers, they're all bad people, Nazis even. Obviously, most people who enter into the medical field are deeply caring, as we can see by the sacrifices healthcare workers are making right now. But when biases exist in general society, like biases against the mentally disabled or racism, they're obviously going to infiltrate the medical community. Because we all live in a society Bottom text. Even the medical community is not immune to the prejudices that exist in our culture. The pandemic is just a dramatic example of what those biases lead to. Differential treatment, which can literally be fatal. Perhaps nothing is more demonstrative of how social hierarchy leads to death than how we treat the unhoused during a pandemic. Right now, shelters aren't a great place to be because, you know, the the virus thing, germ theory, people indoors, you get it. At the same time, hotels and other buildings are being vastly underused because of the pandemic. So what if, what if, what if, what if we took all this extra building space and we gave it to homeless people to, to live in. Well, hey, would you look at that? The Austin City Council is voting on that right now, using funds taken from excessive police budgets to buy empty hotels to house the unhoused. Look, we could do that, or we could continue homeless camp sweeps where SWAT, state troopers, and ICE, armed to the f***ing teeth, show up to kick people out of their shelters, destroy their belongings, and I guess try to deport them. Something which is not only cruel, but also goes against CDC guidance on COVID safety, which advises that kicking people out of their shelters and forcing them to constantly move around is actually bad during a pandemic. Now, I'm, I'm no doctor science, but that kind of makes sense, huh? So, my friends, my cutie patooties, I'm not telling you all this to bum you out. Yes, a, a lot of this stuff is, as the kids say, a real bummer. But I think this last example of how we treat unhoused people really does exemplify the way in which empathy and kindness is actually the logical, science-backed move. Providing everyone with a vaccine, regardless of whether their country has the most money, fighting against racial and disability discrimination in our healthcare system, providing our most vulnerable neighbors with housing. These are not only the kind things to do, but they're doable, and they actually make everyone safer, healthier, and better off. Cruelty, though, only providing vaccines to the highest bidder, allowing prejudice to taint our healthcare system, and treating unhoused human beings like vermin, 
is not just cruel, but threatens everyone. It makes things worse. It's perhaps more tangible when we're talking about a viral disease that is mutating into a worse viral disease, but there's so many other issues like climate change or general quality of life where it still holds true that protecting vulnerable communities trickles up and helps protect all of us. And there are lots of people who recognize this, from the diplomats who saw the importance of making the vaccine attainable for every country in the world, to the houseless advocates in Austin, Texas, getting the city council to vote on giving them housing. People who see how important empathy is to our survival are out there, working hard to advocate for people who need it the most. Cody, I just ran the numbers. What? What numbers? I was really getting sincere there, Katie. These better be important numbers. These numbers, Cody's these. I ran, I ran all of them and I found it. I found it, this is it. This is the answer. What, the answer to, just, just tell me what you wanna say. Ha ha. What? Well, wait, 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 there's more. Huh? Oh, that's so nice. <laughs> Okay, I think we're done here. Thank you for the true science. Hi everybody, thanks for watching. Make sure to like and subscribe and leave a comment that's nice or mean. It's up to you. But the important thing is that you like and subscribe. We've got a patreon.com slash some more news. Even more news is the name of the podcast. And t-shirts as well is a, a, a link that you could find in the description. Like, subscribe.